Good morning, everyone. Welcome, or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, for Nairi's afternoon. For the three of us, it's good morning. Welcome to Conversations with Rudy Rivera. The topic for today is to arbitrate or not, that is a question. And I'm thrilled to have uh, actually three distinguished superstar panelists who had vast experience, not just in litigation, but in arbitration from different parts of the world. Uh, Nayiri in Dubai, Evan in the U.S., and Manuel in the, uh, the States and other places, too. And I've had some domestic and international arbitration experience. So I'd like to, ladies first, Nayiri, I'd like to have everyone just give like a one minute or 30 second blurb on what you do and where you're at. And we'll get yes. right into the thick of it. Yep. Thanks, Rudy. Uh, I'm based in Dubai, as you mentioned, uh, and I've been based here for the last 20 years, and I'm, I'm from this part of the world, I'm from the Middle East. I'm an arbitration practitioner, and in that capacity, I do, uh, I guess I have primarily three roles. I sit as an arbitrator, I act as party counsel, quite often I am local law counsel on the laws of the United Arab Emirates. And I also uh, get appointed as an expert witness on, again, on UAE law matters or advising on UAE law as expert witness. Thank you. Manuel. Oh, well, I've had, uh, currently I'm the, an adjunct professor of law at the uh, Inter-American Law School in Puerto Rico. I've also been uh, the chief administrative law judge of the New York State Division of Human Rights. Chief Administrative Law Judge, Social Security Administration here in Puerto Rico, and an arbitrator for over 35 years, having arbitrated uh, all kinds of cases from commercial to employment to consumer to healthcare. I was also in the healthcare industry for about 10 years as Associate General Counsel for uh, AmeriChoice Corporation, which was uh, ultimately merged or purchased by uh, United Health Group. So I've had an opportunity. In fact, I was one of the first graduates of what was called the Cornell School of Industrial Labor Relations, Hofstra Law School, American Arab Arbitration Association Minority Arbitrator Program back in 86, 87. So um, that, that's my experience. Evan, we get to you now. Thank you, Rudy. Um, I was a trial lawyer for 25 years before I moved in-house with a manufacturing company that I was at for 15 years. And now I <clears throat> am currently the chief legal officer of a pulp and paper company. Uh, I also sit as an arbitrator for the AAA, primarily, although sometimes in private arbitrations. So I've seen it as an advocate, I've seen it as an arbitrator, and I've seen it as a client. Well, I'm chief international counsel for uh, Fortune 500 company. Uh, I've actually never arbitrated. I've been as a litigant in adversarial arb arbitrations, but never had the experience of being the judge. I used to think it was difficult to be a judge because, guys, you have to find the truth. You have to decide. Where when you're an advocate, you just, this is my position. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Uh, the ultimate question for everyone is to arbitrate or not, that is a question. And in my travels, it's been very polarized topic. Some people swear by it. Some people think it's the worst thing in the world. Some people are in the middle of the road. And I think it would be good if our audience knew a little bit of the history. Manuel, can you tell us the history of what really was the purpose of arbitration? I know, for example, AAA has been around since the 20s, but there are a number of other arbitral you know, groups that uh, provide the same services. Can you give us a little background? Well, we can go back all the way to 1705 and forget the AAA. Uh, Pennsylvania developed a first set of laws supporting arbitration. And in 1768, the Chamber of Commerce in New York did the same. New York being a really a, a foundation for arbitral work in the country. In George Washington's will, 1799 in his testament, he has an arbitration clause. If there's any dispute about that will, it goes to arbitration. So arbitration has its roots back in the common law. After the Civil War is really where it begins to take off. 
in two different kinds of ways. New York, in 1874, New York comes up with the arbitrator of the Chamber of Commerce office, which it creates. New York keeps on pro promoting arbitration as a way of resolving the disputes. Maryland did that for what they call voluntary binding arbitration in 1878. New York and Massachusetts in 1886 created permanent arbitration boards. And that's the first beginning of the structures that support arbitration. The first federal labor law was the Arbitration Act of 1888, uh, again, talking about voluntary arbitration. And that creates a tension in what we have today, voluntary versus mandatory arbitration. Uh, and that law was superseded by a federal law in 1898, uh, also in arbitration as a response to the built up of railroads in the United States. As you turn into the 20th century, um, in 1898, Congress passed the Erdman Act to strengthen the Arbitration Act, but it wasn't really until 1925 that the um, federal government got its act together with the basic Federal Arbitration Act, which governs arbitrations today. And in 1926, the year after the American Arbitration Association was founded, was a merger of two arbitration associations that mainly did commercial arbitration. During World War II, you have the buildup of the National War Labor Relations Board that handles labor relations. And that becomes a major push for arbitration inside of the collective bargaining agreement. Post-World War II, we have what we have today. And that is today arbitration in terms of the major um, players. You have the American Arbitration Association as the oldest player. We have JAMS and others as players that handle thousands of cases a year. And that's where you are. But we also have this twist. As, as the power of labor went down, was diminished, you had the buildup of employment law uh, statutes and litigations and protections. And then the beginning of mandatory uh, arbitration for employees. That's novel. That's new. Uh, the concept of arbitration was quick and dirty and simple. Okay, you would simply, the arbitrator was, didn't have to be a lawyer, could be someone who simply knew the shop. And you decided it right there. You had a dispute on the floor, you called up a neutral, both sides gave their piece, and there was a decision. So, no, nothing, and it could be in writing or it could not be in writing, but you just solved this dispute on the spot. As time went on, and a lot of litigators begin to get involved in arbitration, you have all these rules created scenarios where you're now governed by the consumer rules or the employment rules or the commercial rules that take what was simple and resilient and made it more fixed, uh, predictable, but also more costly. So, so your question, the underlying question that appears is it's arbitration is the function of acceptability of the parties. The parties got to accept the arbitrator and the arbitrator is a creation of the contract between those parties. Well, arbitration is a creature of statute. Oh, that history was fascinating. Arbitration is a creature of statute. And I think one of the big problems I see with arbitration is that little effort goes into drafting the actual arbitration agreement or giving thought to it. I, I often think of the song Paradise by the Dashboard Light by um, by Meatloaf, you know. <clears throat> uh, you you want to get together with this person and all of a sudden you get together and now you're praying for the end of time so you don't have to spend any time together. Uh, now, now, Yuri, what, do you see that same issue that people don't give much thought to it? In other words, they negotiate a big M&A agreement and all of a sudden, oh, let's just throw the arbitration clause in there. Totally, totally. So you see a lot of that and what is often discussed at arbitration conferences is what uh, is referred to as pathological clauses, which demonstrate how the parties had not given any thought to the dispute resolution provision. And one recent example I, I worked on, I was appointed as an arbitrator in a matter that was happening in Bahrain. And uh, this arbitration clause, uh, or uh, the dispute clause included arbitration, 
but it was preceded by another provision giving jurisdiction also to the courts. So there was one provision saying that this should be decided by the courts, and then there was another provision right after saying that this should be referred to arbitration. And the way it was drafted demonstrated to me that there was a template, which is often the case. People start from a template, and then they negotiate the, the, a lot of most of the points, but when it comes to, as you said, Rudy, to the arbitration clause, they don't think about it. And sometimes they would just add an arbitration clause while there has already been another clause which provides for the court's jurisdiction. So that's one recent example I've seen which proves the point you have made, Rudy. If I could interject, yes, Rudy. go ahead, Evan. You know, we focus on the, um, the clause itself, but to some extent, speaking from as an in-house counsel, it's not just the written words on the clause. I have to say that it's a criticism of people in my position that they put arbitration in without explaining to the company, the senior managers, what arbitration actually is. And the problem is that means that the clause is sitting there without any context. And then when arbitration actually kicks in, the senior managers are shocked and appalled to find out it's not like the court, you know, stuff that they see on TV. And so it's not just a problem of drafting the clause, and it is a problem, but it's also a problem of making sure that your internal clients or making sure if you're outside counsel, that, you're in, that your, your corporate clients understand that arbitration is not the same thing as litigation. And if there's not that commitment, it's going to be a sleigh ride to hell. Well, I've heard that what what litigators try to do in an arbitration is treat it as a federal court proceeding where it's intended to be more streamlined. And that's part of what brings up the cost. Um, I can remember as a young lawyer when I tried cases, and this was in the 80s, you know, the file was maybe this thick. You know, now the file's like this, you know, and you need artificial intelligence to get to get the uh to get the documents you know but i i think it, you're right it was meant to be simple and now i think maybe in some ways litigators made it more complicated and, and i think partially it's you know litigators are used to saying i don't want to leave any stone unturned i want to throw everything in and they're afraid not to put something in front of the arbitrator right yeah, but again that's the the original sense of, of the arbitration proceeding was that it was not technical. You didn't have to go by. In fact, the rules of evidence still don't apply. Uh, and so the arbitrator was a person who was cognizant of the area. Okay, They were familiar with this kind of employment or dispute, and they could give an expert opinion. So if you just take uh, a quick second here. Uh, let me see if I can get a, a jams contract. Uh, just to some, just to uh, reinforce what's been said. We've got your Zoom screen. Yeah, no, but let me do here. Okay, so here you say stand. Here's a standard arbitration clause from Jams for international commercial contracts. Any dispute, controversy, or claim arising out of or relating to this contract. That's a lot. Maybe you don't want every dispute, including the formation, interpretation, breach of termination thereof, including whether the claims asserted are arbitrable, will be referred to and finally determined by arbitration in accordance with the rules, these rules. If you don't know those rules and you're just adopting this clause and you're not thinking it through, uh, you may have a problem. This may not be what, what you want to do. Tribunal will consist of three arbitrators in this case, etc. So that's just one, one clause. You could go to the American Arbitration Association. You can pick up a clause there. You can go to your partner or your law firm and pick up a clause. But have you worked through the kinks? Have you adjusted this to what you actually need? Do you really need three arbitrators? Or on the other hand, uh, can you use one arbitrator for certain kinds of disputes and three arbitrators for another? Three arbitrators are three times the cost. And that's, that's, that's the beginning of the, of the problem. The other problem is their availability. The first concept in arbitration is acceptability. The arbitrator has to be acceptable to the parties. The parties get to pick their judge. You don't get that in, in litigation. 
You don't pick your judge in federal district court. That person is assigned. Here, you get to pick, have a role in selecting uh, an arbitrator, but that requires you to do an awful lot of due diligence, right? Because if you don't know who that person is, how they resolve those kinds of disputes, you may not run them. And if they're a repeat player, an arbitrator that appears before this kind of company over and over again, then there is a problem which in that and continuing to be acceptable. Well, okay. selecting the, but selecting the arbitrator is a big, big problem sometimes, right? Now, Yuri, how do you go about choosing an arbitrator? And then Evan, how you go about choosing? Because we've got two different mindsets. You know, Evan's in-house, okay? So and he's a litigator. So he's had that experience of the litigation. And so, but Nayiri is outside counsel. You know, how often, tell us about your process for inputting or for saying, I'm going to select an arbitrator and this is my criteria. Yeah, so I guess there are two factors that come to play. There's a question of uh, whether there are certain expertise, specific expertise that are required. And I probably say that before anything else, because in our part of the world, there's so much construction arbitration happening. And so construction districts are very complex and require a certain technical knowledge. Of course, if you're representing a party, then you have to be a construction lawyer, preferably. And if you're an arbitrator, you need to have some experience in construction. And so when we look at candidates, and this has happened, for example, very recently, brainstorming with a client uh, who has a number of construction disputes, uh, I came up with a list uh, with my comments on the experience and the profile of each one of these candidates and sent it to my, to my client. And so again, the key, especially when we're talking about a significant dispute, something of a big value, for example, this client had a case for $150 million last year. In this kind of cases, I would definitely take into consideration whether the person has construction expertise or not, whether he's, he or she is known as a, as a construction arbitrator or, or a construction uh, specialist. There's another factor which is perhaps less relates to methodology but more relates to the nature and the culture of the arbitration world. Arbitration community is generally small. So there's within every jurisdiction, there will be a community of people who know each other. And then there is an international arbitration community uh, where people also know each other. And I think it's not a secret that networking and using your network uh, is essential. And so what happens is that Sometimes people would appoint someone because they know them, they're on good terms with them, they are allies. So I don't think we should hide the fact that that also happens sometimes behind the scenes. Of course, that is not to say that I would appoint one of my best friends as an arbitrator if she or he is clueless about construction. Obviously, as party counsel, I have a duty towards my client. But I have to say that that is an element or a factor that's always somewhere in the back of our minds and it influences our choices. And we tend to opt for people that we know or preferably that we have worked with. One last thing I want to say on uh, the choice of arbitration, and I guess it's up to me, I think it's entirely, I think it's my role to say that in this panel is diversity, to talk about diversity, which is a very big and trendy topic in the arbitration world. So one of the things that we're also witnessing is to promote diversity, uh, which would include gender diversity and it would also include ethnical and regional diversity. Now, where I practice, we've been seeing a lot of emphasis on gender diversity. And, and so that's also another consideration. And so when I send a list to a client with three to five names, also when I send a list of co-arbitrators, when, when I'm on a tribunal and we need to appoint a presiding arbitrator, for me, diversity, especially gender diversity, is always an element that influences my suggestions. And rightly so. Evan, what's your thoughts on it? I don't disagree with Nayeri, but I would add two points. Uh, the first point is I think it's essential to make sure that you find out what is the attitude of the arbitrator or arbitrators toward arbitration. 
I want to contrast what I think of as sort of the old school with the newer school. And I'm a member of the newer school, contrary to what it looks like. The old school thought that arbitrators were simply the tools of the council. And so if council agreed on stuff, then they would just say, sign off on it. And they thought that arbitration often led to essentially compromise verdicts because arbitration, after all, was just trying to get to a result. And the problem was, is that that allowed the council, as you pointed out, Rudy, to turn arbitration into litigation because there was nobody fighting against them. You have two, two lawyer, or lawyers on each side who are trained litigators. And so their culture is to turn it into litigation and nobody's pushing back. The newer school sees the arbitrator as guarding the process and looking towards the interest of the underlying clients who after all signed an arbitration agreement. And their job is to make sure that arbitration is in fact efficient, is in fact not litigation. And I think it's important to try to gauge either through reading what they've written or talking to people who've appeared in front of them, whether they have the right attitude towards arbitration or will let it turn into a, a big problem. The second observation I would make, and now I'm speaking as a client, um, the arbitration community that Nairi referred to is unfort unfortunately, in my view, something of a pernicious problem in the arbitration world particularly with international arbitrations. There is indeed a group of people who tend to do these things a lot. And sometimes they're advocates and sometimes they're arbitrators. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And the problem sitting as a client is what that means is, is the arbitrators tend not to push back against counsel because they know that uh, they want to get appointed to the next arbitration or they're going to be in the counsel's shoes and the other person's gonna be the arbitrator and nobody wants to be that guy. And so the problem is, is that once again, you get a kind of passive arbitrator because the arbitrators are part of this community and everybody wants to get along so that they get the next big arbitration and the one after that. And so I tend to look for arbitrators who are not necessarily part of the community either because for diversity reasons, they haven't made it into the inner circle or because I want somebody who is not looking to just get along with everybody else. And I think that's, again, another critical aspect of the decision to arbitrate is to commit to really investigating your arbitrators and making sure that they are going to do the job that they've been asked to do. Well, sometimes, you know, somebody's gonna be unhappy and I've seen situations where the arbitrator tries to please both parties, and that's the, the splitting of the baby. And, and, you know, AAA has uh, statistics to say, no, they don't split the baby. Um, I, I don't know what basis they look at, how they look at it, but I, I view, you know, you're, it's a beauty contest when you're picking an arbitrator. They want to be hired because they live off of that. You know, when, we, when you compare that to litigation, the judge is there. You know, and he's there. It's not a beauty contest. He's the one you have. Uh, we have a question from uh, Pierre de Ravel. It says, you describe the cognitive bias known as Maslow's hammer. If your tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Many lawyers drafting arbitration clauses assume incorrectly that their client will be the claimant. That has a huge impact on a choice of law and of seed. How often do you use non-arbitration methods such as mediation or dispute boards. Let, let me just, before I go to M Manuel on this, let me point out that we have mandatory pre-arbitration mediation. No arbitration can be filed unless uh, the business unit, the people who can make the decision in the business unit get together. And there's a certain amount of time within 45 days. And it's an attempt to get the business people to talk about, okay, can we work this out before it gets expensive? And that, I think, is a good provision to put in agreements to say we have to mediate first before we just invoke arbitration. Manuel, what's your thought on that? Maslow's um, hammer. As well, a variety of thoughts. First off, as um, associate counsel for three corporations, uh, I said no arbitration, only mediation. And that really worked. That really worked for healthcare disputes of all kinds and descriptions. 
So that's my take on that. In terms of the hammer thing, I think a lot of uh, attorneys drafted as if they were re uh, de potential respondents or defendants, not claimants. So it depends. The, the more current, more sophisticated, more complicated clauses see themselves as potential defendants. And from that perspective, we try to put together what they don't do is really look at it from a uh, neutral perspective. How do you go down the, that spectrum? Should we have early neutral evaluation first, get some experts in? I always wanted the business people to talk to the business people and pull the attorneys out. I found the attorneys were absolutely not helpful in trying to understand the initial dispute when it came to healthcare. Uh, and when I the business folks talked, then they would inform and literally educate their clients, the attorneys. Uh, it, it was the other way around. <laughs> it was the business folks really trying to come to terms for what we were ongoing relationships. And there are really two kinds of arbitrations, those that maintain ongoing relationships, including construction, and those that are simply one shots. My, my response to Evan is there are a whole bunch of part-time uh, arbitrators who, do, who don't form part of this network and also should be considered for, for potential positions on arbitral panels. But my thing about the current state of affairs is if, if the attorneys want to turn it into a mini litigation, that's not its purpose. Its rules are not so different. For me, the glaring difference technically is that the hear, hearsay is admissible. Everything is admissible. Everything can come in. And the, and the statute in the cases favor that, an open process. When you start acting like litigators, i.e. trying to keep things out, you harm the process and you make sure it harm the enforcement of that judgment. So parties need to really think these things through and do a lot more due diligence in checking out who an arbitrator may be, including looking up awards if they're available. And if, the, if an arbitrator has had a, an award challenged, then that would be available in a court of law. Otherwise, the one thing we have not even mentioned is this thing is about confidentiality. One of the reasons you do this is not because it's cheaper or it's faster, it's confidential. It's a private form of justice where the American public really is not in the know. And it's only coming into the know by way of consumer arbitration. Well, there's, uh, now you're, what's, what's your thought on that? I, I think that, um... You have to know the ultimate end game, right? And whether you're the claimant or not, I always take the position that if this thing is going to go bad and we're going to fight an American expression tooth and nail, right? Where do I want to end up? And what's the ultimate result I want? Yeah. And how's it going to be presented? Go ahead. Yeah. On mediation, there are a couple of things that I'd like to say. And I'm not a mediation practitioner myself. Now, first, there's a distinction between mediation and simple or general settlement talks. And I've noticed that clients probably, and even sometimes practitioners don't know the difference. The minute we say mediation, there's a mediator who's a third party who will get involved in order to help the parties uh, reach a settlement. And there are actually techniques and there's certain methodology behind mediation. It's not just random, it's just this me sitting with the two parties and uh, having a general chat. There are training, there are things that the mediator should bear in mind. There's actually a methodology to it. Now, quite often clients or business people don't know that there's a, there's a, this mediator who should have a certain methodology and you should pay. So it's, it's also, it involves costs. So we have that as mediation and we have talks between the, the two parties which do not involve a third party and which do not cost you fees. And so what I've seen is if, I think whether you include a, an escalation clause requiring this talks and settlement talks between the parties or not, what I've seen is that parties would generally try to avoid arbitration or going to court and they will sit and talk. I have not seen many successful negotiations of that sort. When it comes to mediation, mediation is not yet spread enough or known enough, and it's not institutionalized in our part of the world. 
while it is institutionalized in, I would say, Europe or North America, and you would know better. And so in that context, I think it could be successful. I just have not experienced it myself. Evan, what about you? My view is that generally by the time a problem has gotten to my desk, the two business, the two sides of the business dis dispute hate each other. And everything is broken <laughs> down because the last person anybody wants to talk to is me. So <laughs> I have been very, um, I have not been satisfied by these multi-step um, escalation clauses. Because in my experience, and this is where I differ from Manuel, most of the escalation is check the box, the senior executives get together, they yell at each other, everybody goes away, and then they hand it back to me and say, it's still your problem. I think it's the discipline of going to formal dispute resolution, that is to say arbitration, that will make people settle. So my view is you got to trigger the arbitration. The arbitration has to happen quickly. In other words, none of the six months waiting from the time of the demand to finally getting your panel set up. And then the arbitrate, everybody has to perceive that we're not going to have a year of discovery. We're going to have an arbitration panel that's going to get to the merits and is going to decide. And once the business people see that clear reality, I think that will promote, that promotes discussion more than anything more than anything else actually uh, in my world this worked very well and i understand and, that people have different it, experiences no no it, it really depends on your environment so as in-house lawyer you have to know your environment to know what's going to work or not um our agreements tend to be big technology agreements that take 18 months or so to implement and like both sides are anxious to get this thing done because the customer wants the software installed and we want to get it out, out of the way that's that's the issue. Yeah. Now, Yuri, you have I you're ready to, to add because Ivan raised the point uh, on how the, by the time the case file gets on the, his desk, uh, the parties are just yelling at each other and they they hate each other. One of the things I've noticed is sometimes the ego gets in the way. You think? Maybe not sometimes. Well, maybe most have most egos. <laughs> and I've noticed that. There will be instances where the client wants to fight just because it's an ego issue. And I have, and that's where obviously the negotiation will break down. And I have noticed that the ego gets it in the way and parties become emotional mostly when it's a shareholders dispute. And I wonder whether, I mean, I don't have a degree in psychology, so I don't know what would be the psychological reasons for that. I just assume that maybe because when people are partners, shareholders in a company, they start the relationship as friends, they're on very good terms. And that's why when they become uh, when bitter, it's, it's, it's extreme. So that has been my experience as opposed to other kinds of contracts or disputes which involve two independent separate parties, I've noticed that they will be still a bit more willing to, to negotiate. And another thing I've noticed on the ego is sometimes, again, if I take the example of a construction dispute, the engineer, for example, who is responsible of that project, sometimes he will get so emotional and he's, okay, I mean, he's entangled that, that he would be a, a hurdle while if you remove that specific engineer who was so engaged and you you bring it on board other members of the team, you deflate the tension and there's more room for talks. So the psychological element, whether we call it ego or not, I've mm -hmm. noticed that it plays a very big part. Well, uh, Manuel, I'll have you comment on it, but it's, an, uh, it's the first time I've ever heard lawyers have big egos. You know, I've never heard that before, but that's often a problem. And, uh, you know, with regards to mediation, it really depends on the culture. You know, I've tried unsuccessfully to mediate in Latin America. Nobody wants to disclose anything because in civil law jurisdictions, there's no discovery. You know, so if they don't know it, I'm not going to tell them. And the lawyers told his client he's got a winner. And therefore, you can't go back and say you should settle. Manuel, but I have you comment on that. So, <laughs> I agree. Uh, egos are very much involved, which is why I think uh, mediation is a, is a genius process. It really allows those well-trained mediators to really capture that moment as they shuffle between 
uh, the two sides uh, attempting to understand what's going on. I think all of these things are simply listening forums. How do you mm -hmm. listen to what really is the issue or the controversy? Mm -hmm. How do you figure that one out? Not simply what they're telling you, hey, we want this. This is uh, our first our first demand, which is outrageous, versus another outrageous demand on the other side. And that that takes time. That takes effort. And that takes skill and experience. And I think that's the that's what arbitrators offer as well. They have that experience, that skill built over time. They are not subject, however, to public accountability, uh, which is my pet peeve with that. If I take it for a second, I just compare litigation to arbitration for a second. Let me just run that uh, comparison. Um, the scenario becomes a little different. Hang on. And let me get this up. Okay, if you look at the compare of the two, and by the way, this PowerPoint, it's much more extensive, it's available to anybody on this uh, webinar. So simply ask for it, we'll just send it to you. But if you look at the arbitration process now, today, it, and compared to litigation, well, you got a, a demand, the clause dictates the venue, the forum, the rules, the claimant or respondent may pay the fees, you know, who pays, does the, uh, that's a big deal, and that's decided versus a uh, consumer versus commercial. The litigation process begins with the complaint, you file it, you pay your filing fee, you choose your venue, you forum. The court rules are already set. You don't get to create your rules, but you have the power in arbitration to create the rules and put that in your clause. Otherwise, you, you take on the rules that belong to the arbitral forum, the American Arbitration Association, JAMS, et cetera. Okay, you have a preliminary conference in arbitration, you have a rule 16B on the civil procedure uh, in federal court and you got discovery. And uh, that depends on the law and it can be limited. No subpoenas, no depositions, although I've allowed deposition. Uh, and each side had all these discovery tools in what are federal rules 26 to 37, the federal rules of civil procedure. Those, all of that panoply is not available in the arbitral process necessarily, but it's come to, it's come to be available it's come to be used. Non-party discovery, well, you don't get that. No subpoenas are allowed by many state or federal courts against mm -hmm. non-parties. You can mm -hmm. do that, you can get those in the litigation process. Motions are generally not favored, especially a motion in limine, since the arbitrator is subject to inclusion rather than exclusion of documentation. Motions are the, 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 the heart of the litigation process. The hearing is generally fixed early on, Hard to change, but it's also hard to get a date if you have three arbitrators who will have very busy schedules and now you're six months, nine months out or a year out before you get your hearing. The hearing is fixed by the court. And again, that's not fixed either. It's interesting. Uh, I was on 24 hour call in uh, New York um, in district court, federal district court for over a year, 24 hour call. So that means that and they call me the day before and they said, show up with your witnesses, we'll try your case. And here I am representing the federal government and we're on 24 hour call. Uh, the award could be one line or two lines, fair award or an employment arbitration, a reasoned award. This is something that the parties are paying for. The parties could end up paying $30,000 on a $150,000 dispute. That's one example. You, the judge has to issue an award, it's due process, fundamental. And there are no appeals except on narrow grounds. Whereas, of course, you can appeal any court matter or subject. So just comparing the two processes, the way they've been outlined, to the extent the arbitral process comes to mirror the litigation process, it will become slow, mm -hmm. inefficient, and expensive. And in one out of two cases, that's what's happening. Well, but, uh, but again, Manuel, you paint the picture in a way that I, I just have to disagree with. Go ahead. First of all, if you have a good arbitrator, you can get a streamlined process, particularly if the parties understand what's going on. Second, you can actually get subpoenas in an arbitration if they can be enforced 
and I've signed arbit I've signed subpoenas out of the AAA arbitration that have been forced against uh, parties, uh, third parties. Um, my my final point, however, is I tried a lot of cases in 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 federal and state courts, and yes, there are some judges and some fora that are reasonably efficient and reasonably effective. But if you've ever tried a complicated accounting case or a business dispute case in a state court before a judge who used to be a prosecutor and has no idea how business works, it is like swimming upstream in molasses. And I have to say that one of the big advantages of arbitration is you can pick somebody who has a clue. And if the parties are willing to go with the arbitration process, it can be much shorter and much more effective because the average time to resolution in a lot of state courts and even in a fair number of federal courts is a long time. I had a dispute in New York, New York in, in the Southern District of New York where the judge said, uh, or the judge's clerk said, I just want you guys to know the judge is getting ready for a big criminal trial. And so everybody should know that nothing's gonna happen in your civil cases for a year. So. Again, everybody can tell their horror stories. That's one of mine. Um, but, it, but it comes down to the commitment of the parties. Don't arbitrate if you're not committed to the process. Don't arbitrate. If it's a $150,000 dispute, most of the time, just pick a single arbitrator, get them to issue an award, and recognize that one side or the other is going to feel incredibly angry, but it's over. And that's the goal. If it's a $150 million dispute, well, then it's worth it to have the arbitrator write a reasoned decision because everybody wants to know how it came out that way. So it's, an, or it's a question of proportion and you have to convince your clients if you're outside counsel like you guys or if you're in-house counsel like me, you have to convince them that the scope of the arbitration has to relate to the scope of the dispute and that it makes no sense to overinvest whether you're going to court or you're going to arbitration if your dispute is doesn't justify it. Well, part of it, and I'll have the Yuri comment on it. We have a question, but I'll just make a quick comment to you. A problem with business units sometimes is they're gung-ho about litigation or arbitration until they see the cost when it comes against the quarter. Remember, companies live and die by the quarter. And so, oh, I didn't think this was going to be so expensive. So then you're stuck in a position, how do I get rid of this thing that's gone out of control? And by the way, we do have a, a comment from somebody with AAA. And by, by the way, <clears throat> we're not criticizing AAA, I don't think, in this thing. Uh, uh, the myth that the arbitrators split the baby, I've seen it in some cases. Um, but our, AAA says, AAA statistics showing that AAA arbitrators don't split the baby are based on thousands of AAA administrative cases and don't see this issue, but ad hoc arbitration administered by the institutions might see this, okay? It's a little bit of a commercial, but, you know, they, the AAA has their statistics to, to, I guess, to disprove this myth. Um, and honestly, in all our clauses, AAA is, is written in on these uh, clauses. But the question I have for you, um, Nayiri, uh, from the same person, Pierre, and thank you, Pierre, for your participation. Doesn't the choice of tools depends on whether preserving the relationship between the parties is paramount to long-term JV or major construction project? Then to Evan's comment, how about the ARB to me to ARB type of clauses? Mediation is very helpful to narrow down the real issue in disputes I have found. So arbitration, mediation, arbitration, I assume that's what the question is. What's your thought on that, Nayiri? Yeah, well, I think the point mentioned here on preserving the relationship is actually very important. It's really very valuable. And it's true that I, I would say that if the parties are interested in maintaining the business relationship that they have, then they will be more inclined to reach uh, a settlement, to negotiate in good faith. And, uh, and I have to say that I have seen that. I've seen that to the extent that I had a client who had a huge claim uh, the client was the, and still is actually their contractors and the other parties, the employer or the developer, and one of the major ones in the UAE. And for one of the projects they had worked on, and they worked together on big projects all the time, 
my client, the contractor, was not paid a very big chunk, actually, of their costs, their fees. And so we were getting prepared to, to have an arbitration, but the client, not the general counsel, the decision maker, I mean, the senior management, the, the CEOs, they decided that they are not going to fight this because they want to maintain the relationship because they might get more work and other projects from that developer. The... Um... The thing that that I did I learned recently, uh, Evan, at the annual ACC meeting, is that international arbitral awards are public records, unless the party decides that it's not going to be public. I didn't know that. And there's an interesting startup I learned called Juice Mundi. It's a database that allows you to search arbitrators what cases they have pending. Um, and, and you can basically do your evaluation because when I was involved, it's who do you know and what experience do you have? And you have these certifications. And to me, a certification is absolutely worthless because many of these certifications are purchased. Some are earned, obviously. But I still think selecting, a, you know, even under organized systems is a beauty pageant. But this might be an interesting tool for somebody to say, well, let me see how many arbitration, how many awards this guy's done. Pretty much how you do with a court, which is something I've never heard. And it's a company by a bunch of young geek tech guys that I think, you know, may may eventually be a useful tool for us. Actually, the AAA hat also now publishes some reasoned decisions by arbitrators, but they redact the party's names. So and especially you in the employment matters. In the employment yeah, matters, they're all published with the redaction that everyone talk, right. talks about. But the employment, the problem with the employment scenario is those are the claims that you talked about were 150,000 or below, and they require a reason award in, all, yeah, in every yeah. single one of those cases, unless the parties otherwise state. But mm -hmm. the default is a reason award. It's also non non employment. Some of my decisions are published, for example, although the parties are are, are reduced. Uh, I guess the point I wanted to make about mediation in response to the question, I think that in in the appropriate circumstance, structured mediation with an experienced mediator can be a very good thing, particularly to with parties that do have to live with each other. But it's not just like you pick some guy and you go to mediation for half a day and you figure, okay, that'll solve the problem. If you do that, you're just checking the box. It's not a real mediation. Again, you have to have people committed to mediation. You have to have people committed to flipping over some of the cards and actually disclosing their position. And you have to have a mediator who can really work the problem. And I've seen that work, but I've also seen a lot of mediations fail because the parties come and they, they, they don't want to try to compromise. They just want somebody to tell them that they're right. And that's when you, you know, when you're at that point, you have to go either to litigation if you want the big litigation model, or you have to go to arbitration to get somebody to just say, this person's right, this person's wrong, everybody go away. Well, I, I, I think you go back to the, this concept of passive versus active mediator and passive mm -hmm. versus active arbitrator. If you are an active mediator, an active par arbitrator, you're really concerned with addressing the needs of those parties and getting an expedited opinion that makes sense in light of all the thing that's coming before you. And I think that's, that's, that's really where you want to trend off. The problem, the fallout is that somebody's going to be upset because you're going to have a decision adverse to one of the parties. And that's where I think uh, you know, we all might agree that when you write an award, a reasoned award, you're reading or writing it for the losing party. The winning party kind of just wants to win the losing party has to explain to themselves and to their clients why it is this happened. I think that's where the arbitrator has to be at their best and really going through that record and showing uh, impartiality, neutrality, a sense of, hey, I really heard you. And this is where I come out on this. Whether that's a long award or a shorter award, I think that's where you want to go. And that's where the skill and the experience of the mediator or the arbitrator counts. Meter does that orally, interestingly enough. They don't do that uh, in writing and they shouldn't. That's not the process of mediation. But some of the best mediators will really go out of their way 
to explain in private session, even in public session where the two parties are together, what, why, what the why of all of this? And uh, beyond the ego, beyond the shouting and screaming. Now remember, in labor arbitration, shouting and screaming is okay. That's part for the course. I mean, you don't, if you don't like shouting and screaming, don't ever go to a labor arbitration. And I get a sense construction might be like that, but I'm not sure. But I know the shouting and screaming is going on. And that's okay, because you need a safety valve. You need the place where you can let, and that includes the attorneys. Attorneys shouting at their clients, everything is fair game. Everything is fair game. It is exp experiential. It is something that really will make you cut your teeth and you say, you know what? I want to do commercial arbitration. Hey, I, now Yuri, I see you laughing. Is it the same in construction? They're screaming and yelling at each other? I, no, luckily I have not seen people screaming and shouting at an arb during an arbitration process, whether it's at the hearing or uh, CMC calls. Uh, but one thing I wanted to say, uh, it ties up back to what that was being said earlier about the comparison between arbitration and litigation. And what Manuel was saying about shouting, the culture of arbitration is, or at least supposed to be different from the culture of litigation. Or we, to put it different, there's a certain culture in the arbitration world, especially if we talk about the international arbitration world. And that culture requires well, first of all, that you should be, you be a bit more civilized than you would be in the litigation context. And the, the rationale for that is, as was mentioned earlier, arbitration is something that you have opted for. So if the parties have chosen arbitration, then the parties and their counsel should abide by a certain code of conduct. And there's also a lot that's being written and researched and talked about on counsel conduct in international arbitration over the last few years. And I'm a very big fan and supporter of that because I do think that arbitration should be different of course, because of the efficiency and all these other, other factors, but also it would be nicer if people remain civilized and they don't shout and they respect that the fact that they have agreed to arbitration and as a result, they have to abide by the rules and they should not hinder the process. And I perhaps I particularly get annoyed or this issue becomes an issue to me, for me, when I sit as an arbitrator and I see that party counsel is not actually conducting themselves the way I think they should. Therefore, I'm a very big fan and supporter of promoting more rules about counsel conduct and certain arbitral institutions are actually incorporating that in their rules. Yeah, I, agree with, also, yeah. I agree with Nayeri and I, I think it comes, it, you know, the, in, in court, the judge is sitting way up here and everybody's way down on the floor. Um, in arbitration, you're all sitting around a conference table. And I think that it's partly the parties, partly their counsel, and partly the arbitrator who all have responsibilities to make this more of a collegial, we're just trying to resolve the dispute. We're not trying to um, turn this into World War III. Um, it, <laughs> A, it's one of the reasons why I personally, and I know I respect them, but I personally am reluctant to appoint retired judges as arbitrators because their habits are still those of the court, even if they try not to. And it's they the think they're reason, on the bench. They think they're on the bench, yeah. Exactly. And it's the second reason why I, this is a trivial point, but it's a cultural point. When I'm sitting as an arbitrator, people have a tendency to call me your honor. And I keep explaining... I'm not, a, I'm not a judge. I work for a living. We're just here to resolve the dispute. And so as long as we're respectful, we're just sitting around the table. Your job is to present the facts. My job or our job, depending on the arbitrators, is to resolve it. But this is just a business-like way of resolving dispute. We are not turning this into anything overtly formalistic. And I think that is a, sometimes the cultural difference is sometimes overlooked when people are making the decision whether to arbitrate or not to arbitrate. Well, as, as, a, for, as a former judge, <laughs> I think when I was teaching my judges, if they, were heard, if they heard the word your honor, it was to mean be on your honor, be as respectful as you can to the parties, 
that's an invocation from my perspective. And that uh, good old Nietzsche said, well, the higher the mountain, the lower the valley must be. So humility is the way to go across the board. I don't mm -hmm. care what your titles were. I don't care where you went to school. I really count conduct and experience. And, and, that, and, and that's if, often if that's, what, if that's what you're giving me, then I don't care if you were a former judge or not. I care about what it is you can contribute to a uh, process of resolving a dispute. Well, we have about five minutes left, and the topic is to arbitrate or not. And Niyiri, we'll start with you because I know you have a hard stop. But tell me, when you what, under what circumstances would you just not arbitrate? Uh, I see a lot of circumstances. Uh, I'm tempted to say that arbitration is overrated. And I say that for a variety of reasons. First of all, there's this issue of costs. And this was discussed earlier. Sometimes the costs are, sometimes quite often actually from what I've seen, they, they go totally beyond control. And uh, you have this very, very huge legal fees. And sometimes you do not recover them for different reasons. So for me, that's a very big factor that should be taken into consideration. And, and it's actually an issue if you have a small matter, if you have a case for, for example, I was sitting as an arbitrator in a matter, in a claim for $136,000 uh, or the equivalent of $136,000. And this case went on and on and on and the parties were making these very lengthy submissions, although the legal question was quite simple and straightforward. To the point that I have pointed out to one of the party councils that it's really unnecessary to make all this uh, huge submission, which looked more like an academic dissertation thesis. Uh, and eventually, after this lengthy process, I mean, it was lengthy bearing in mind the value of the claim, they were awarded an amount which was not the entirety of their claim and in total bearing in mind the legal costs and arbitration costs that they had to incur, they ended up with one fifth of their total claim. And which I think is not much if you're gonna fight over it for two years. So people have to be reasonable. And But I think a lot of the blame is on the council because the client will not know what's going on. doesn't know exactly how arbitration operates. So I've seen, and I think it's sometimes or quite often that councils are not giving perhaps the right advice to the client and they make these proceedings drag. And so if the value is small, I think it's not worth going for arbitration. And this is would be especially true if you opt for an arbitral institution that charges by the hour. And this was a case where the institution was by the hour, the institution rates and my rates. As opposed to institutions where you have uh, you you know upfront what's 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 coming, what what the costs are. So that's a big consideration. Mm -hmm. The other consideration, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to talk about construction again. If you have an arbitration, mm -hmm. if the dispute is of technical nature, then sometimes you're better off opting for arbitration because as I was saying earlier, you'll have people, arbitrators with the necessary knowledge, which you will not find if you go to the court. And also construction disputes require the appointment of experts who will provide this very lengthy and detailed expert opinions, which also you will not have the benefit of if you go to courts because the expert is not paid enough, he's gonna do a hasty job. Mm -hmm. And so that's another consideration, the nature of the dispute and whether it requires, it has it's a certain technical knowledge. So costs and the nature of the dispute, I would say. Well, we have a comment uh, which goes to what we've been saying. I actually didn't realize Juice Moonley was listening to, to this uh, cast, but they bring up an important point. Uh, they get valuable data on experience and expertise arbitrators when looking to appoint a tribunal member. Uh, they're, they're basically talking about their system of seeing the decisions. You can spot potential conflicts of interest amongst tribunal members when arbitrators worked as co-arbitrators in council in the past. So he sees transparency as a strong way to promote arbitration. And, you know, I would agree with that. We've all said that transparency is, is, is good. Uh, Evan, when would you and what would you not? 
my general well first of all most of the time it's not up to me because we've already written into the contract so it's not like i suddenly get to decide but if it's your I, choice when would you and when would you not if it's my choice i i would generally opt for arbitration you know if arbitra if you're going to arbitrate a hundred and fifty thousand dollar dispute i'll tell you the costs in federal district court are going to be more than the dispute itself so that doesn't that doesn't really help the only time I would not arbitrate, and again, with all the caveats about picking the right arbitrator and committing to the process, is if you need to establish a public point, you know, this is what the law is, so that you can establish it for all the cases you're facing, uh, then I would want to go to court because arbitration doesn't have any precedential value in any meaningful sense. But for me, I'm a much, I'm a stronger proponent of arbitration than apparently the other three boxes on this computer, because I think most of the time it's a better choice than wandering into some court where the judge doesn't care, doesn't like you, and wants you just to go away. And in an arbitration, you're picking the arbitrator, and at least they can be, you can assure yourself they're somewhat committed to the process. So that's my view. Uh, Manuel, and then I'll have, as the moderator, I have the privilege of closing remarks. <laughs> I think what uh, people who don't know arbitration have seen here today is the reason why arbitration is so important, so critical, and so valuable. You've heard today the expertise of many a year of experience or many a case complicated presented to you. And if that's what you want or need, then that's what you're looking for. On the other hand, you don't get to choose when you get sued by another major entity, and now you have to make a public point in federal court, which I've had to do. And I've had to come up with doctrines or concepts in support of uh, matters that are nascent, are developing. So, both horror exist, but I would call for more public accountability of this private system of justice. Thank you. Well, my comments on when I would and when I wouldn't is, for example, I litigate a lot in Mexico. In a litigation, I would never, never arbitrate, okay? I did it once, it was a disaster. But normally what I find is the quality of lawyer that sues sues us is not that great and i find that i can win in the judicial process i expect to lose at the state court level and i have and then we win on appeal now it's very popular when it comes to treaty arbitration those are very popular because you're not into the local court system you don't have the local judge you know the homeboy rule um, and so that seems to be very successful in latin america when it comes to treaty arbitration a friend of mine in mexico just won like a 300 million dollar award so it does work. I don't think it works in litigation. I think that it's it can be a beauty contest. It's very difficult to know the qualities. You rely on word of mouth. And I think you just need to be very calculated about when you're going to do it, in which cases you're not going to do it. Be clear about that. You know, Evan, when you say it comes to you, uh, you know, I think part of it is as in-house counsel, we need to educate our people that when they're negotiating these contracts, think about it at the time and not come to you afterwards. And, th and that's what we've done in my company. When they're negotiating a dispute resolution clause, it comes to me and they say, what, what are you going to do? Uh, and that's, and I say, no, don't do that. Don't put that in there. Um, another reason I think would be, I would arbitrate is in most civil law countries, the loser pays all the cost. And that cost could be substantial. In some countries, the cost is a percentage of what you're asking for. So if you're asking for $20 million and the cost is 20% of what you're asking for, not attorney fees, then you need to know that. So to me, it's you got to tell the person the entire scenario of events that could occur and what could go wrong. And that's what's lacking. So with that, you know, thank you so much for, for attending. I know, um, thank, you, well, thank, thank you for the questions. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, my YouTube audience, my LinkedIn audience for listening. I'm gonna stop the recording now.